ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه وأزواجه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون all praise is due to Allah, we praise Him the way He deserves to be praised. And we seek refuge with Allah from the evil within our souls and the consequences of our bad deeds. Whomsoever Allah guides, no one can lead astray and whomsoever Allah allows to go astray because they do not want any guidance that no one can guide. And I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship except Allah, He is alone and He has no partners. <coughs> and I bear witness that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is his slave and his messenger. We ask Allah to exalt His mention and to grant Him peace and to send His salutations and His blessings upon Him and upon His companions and wives and all those who follow them on their path of righteousness until the day of recompense. All you who have believed, be mindful of Allah and fear Him the way He deserves to be feared and do not die except in the state of submission as Muslims. Brothers in Islam, it is no secret to any one of you that the times and the era in which we are living have changed drastically from what we have known in the past. And I would say if I look back 10 years into the condition of the Muslims and the Muslim community, and then you look at it once again today, it is almost as if you're looking at two different communities that have nothing to do with each other. We have become engulfed and surrounded and bombarded by all types of trials, temptations and satanic plots and schemes against us. Some of which are beyond our control and those we have no solution for, as in no immediate solution for. Those are the things that require a long-term project, a long-term goal with a roadmap and steps that have to be taken individually and as a community to achieve them. And those we have discussed in many of the previous khutab. We've addressed this from this member many times. Because going through the shortcuts, as we mentioned, will not get us to our destination. In these matters, there is no shortcut. The shortcut is to Jahannam. The shortcut is to destruction. The shortcut is to deviance. The shortcut is to innovation. There is no shortcut. If there was a shortcut, then the Prophet ﷺ would have been the first to implement. Because he clearly stated to the Ummah, I am never given a choice between two things except that I choose the easiest. As long as it is not forbidden. So one of the principles of our deen is that you don't seek difficulty. You don't seek difficulty. If difficulty comes, you deal with it patiently so that your reward will be increased. But you don't seek it. You seek ease and facilitation in everything, in everything in this life. It is meant to be easy. So if there was a shortcut, the Prophet ﷺ would have guided us to the shortcut. Why? 
would he want to make things difficult upon his ummah? When he used to cry, alayhi salatu salam, and beg Allah that his ummah is not harmed in any way, shape, or form. But that's to teach us a lesson. That for the rectification of the ummah in totality, towards the end of time, it is not an easy thing to do. It's not about collecting a bunch of enthusiastic youth and giving them some weapons and say, go, go do the fatah of the ummah. Open up the lands in the name of Allah. All they do is spread more corruption than the existing corruption. And they come back with no limbs and no heads and no minds. This is if they come back at all. They've been trying it all over the place. Result is negative. Because the Prophet ﷺ didn't do this in the beginning. He first raised. He raised the Sahaba in a spiritual sense. Not as a father raises his child. By spending on him and sending him to school and educating him. He raised them. He nurtured them spiritually. Until they became, in terms of spirituality, the best of men. Period. They were the best men to ever walk upon the surface of the earth after the prophets themselves. Were the companions of the Prophet ﷺ. And with those came the majd, the glory that Allah gave this ummah that we are trying to benefit from until today. Failing miserably nevertheless. But that is not the topic. The topic is actually the things which are within our control. And some of these diseases that have spread among the people today. Primarily having to do with love and anxiety, stress, depression, worry, and the list goes on. What is known as psychological problems or mental problems or whatever technical scientific term they have for that stuff out there. And a lot of the Muslims are unaware. They are unaware in terms of how to deal with these Islamically. They don't realize that within Islam, we actually have 99% of the solution. The 1% left is for that shrink or that psychiatrist or psychologist if there's any benefit in that 1% with that person. Assuming he's a Muslim and he knows what he's doing and the whole nine yards. Not some kafir who's gonna tell you that the remedy for your problem is to have a glass of wine every night before you sleep and go to the beach and enjoy the people over there. Some stupid advice that only makes your life worse. A Muslim, however, does not need anybody. For the most part, these are spiritual diseases. Let's speak about the concept of love. Love is a very generic term. And it has both positive and negative connotation. As in, it could be something good in the right context, and it could be something terrible in the wrong context. Needless to say, a good connotation or usage of love is loving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and loving His Messenger, messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and loving your fellow brother in Islam and the list goes on. The praiseworthy type of love, no one has any problems with that. Then you have another area of love and fascination. And that could exist between Opposite genders that are not related, or not married, or married. Whatever the case may be, love has a gauge and a limit. Once you exceed it, it will hurt you. This is why Ibn al-Qayyim rahimahullah when discussing the subject matter, he mentioned that, that that idea of having that crazy love for someone 
is actually because of the weakness of Iman and the weakness in love of Allah. Had the person loved Allah enough, then nothing can overpower, overtake, or even take a share with that. When that love is not sufficient, that leaves some vacancy for any other type of love, be it halal love or haram love, haram love, and then when that occupies the heart, it becomes one of the most deadliest diseases a human being can deal with that no doctor can cure. And that's why the Salaf used to say, love is a sign of an empty heart. It's a sign of an empty heart. This is not to say that one shouldn't love anyone, or that a husband doesn't love his wife, or the wife does not love her husband. No way. We know the Prophet Wasallam loved Aisha immensely, to the point that he was asked, who is, who is the most beloved of people to you? And the Sahabi was hoping he would tell him, you. And if my memory serves me well, it was Abu Musa al-Ash'ari. He told him Aisha. He, he said, basically, O Messenger of Allah, I don't mean among your wives or women, among men. He said, her father. The scholars say, he didn't even say Abu Bakr. He still used the pronoun. Abu Ha, the Ha refer her father. He still related the subject matter to Aisha. Yet, if we were to analyze the heart of the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we know that the love he had for Allah cannot be overtaken by any other love. And that is the gauge, that is the cue for everybody. If that love makes you reach a point where your Iman your relationship with Allah, your, your commitment to Islam is on the line, that cannot be an okay, healthy type of love. Where a woman is willing to disobey Allah in order to obey her husband, and vice versa. This is assuming the couple are married. Don't ask about unmarried couple. Whom if they open this door for themselves, they may never be able to close it again. Women being fascinated with men or the other way around and there could be no grounds for this love to, to be nurtured, to grow, there's no marriage possible for whatever the circumstances may be, then that person would basically have to struggle for the rest of their lives. And it may lead to even further corruption in the future that I don't even want to highlight right now. Just because it's sickening. That's why whenever we have these issues, my brothers and sisters in faith, we have to think about the solution immediately and take action. This is a sign of weakness of faith. This is a sign that we need a spiritual remedy. And this is why we need to understand the Quran and the Sunnah and the concept of Ruqya in Islam. This is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said in a hadith that whosoever's concern is the hereafter. Whoever has his main concern in the hereafter. Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala will make this person independent of others. And he will make him focused and content. And this worldly life will come to his feet. His provision will come to his feet. And whosoever's concern is this worldly life and whatever is related to it, Allah will make him forever dependent on others. And He will make him unfocused and confused. And nothing will come to him from this worldly life except that which was decreed for him. So they're going absolutely nowhere. They're going around in circles. This is an indication about the relationship with the life to come. The stronger it is, and we ask Allah to forgive us for our shortcomings, the more you're able to maneuver through this life swiftly. Swiftly. Issues will come, issues will be resolved. Your relationship with Allah is not put on a stake at any point in time. My brothers in faith, may Allah bless you. It is not permissible for someone to arrive late for the khutbah. 
and Alish Sheikh Balish, you have to pray two rak'at barakallah feek. This is the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu If you enter the masjid, you have to pray two rak'at. I have conveyed the message for the future, ya akhwan. This is the sunnah of the Prophet. If you enter late, may Allah bless you. You may not walk over the shoulders of people. It, it's just the way it is. This is our deen is organized. Subhanallah, very organized. You come late, the tax of coming late is being at the door or being outside or even missing Juma altogether. The one who comes early and the one who comes two hours after him, is it? Are they equal? So they sit next to each other. La Allah, they're not equal. And Allah does not allow it to be equal. So we have rules and guidelines. I don't like to put anyone on the spot, but the Prophet ﷺ during Jum'ah had a very similar incident. A man came late, he told him, stop where you are. Stop walking over the shoulders of people. He said that, he told him, get up and pray. Subhanallah al -Azim. It's nothing personal. I don't know any one of you personally to be going after him. But this is a lesson to be learned. With nothing but love, wallah. But we all learn from each other's mistakes. For the future, please act accordingly. May Allah bless you. So this is the idea of the connection which we have with Allah. The issue of love then is one which each one of us has to evaluate on his own. When you think about love in the ultimate sense, who, who comes first? This is the question we should ask. Who's the first person that comes to mind? And if that person is a fellow human being, we say Allah al -Musta'an. Allah al -Musta'an. Because those in this worldly life are not meant to be forever. Spouse, parents, wife, uh, I'm sorry, child, eventually our destination is to perish. And you might have to live that. You might have to live the loss of a loved one. And if we don't have that connection with Allah, then that misery is, is unimaginable. But when we have that connection with Allah, then you have the <coughs> expressions of the patient person, the attitude of a patient person, the iman of a patient person. You know this dunya is meant to be full of struggle, full of, of difficulty, full of pain. It's meant to be this way. It's not meant to be any other way. It is not meant to be Jannah right now. It is not meant to be Jannah. Many people want Jannah today. Jannah is then, not today. Today is struggle. Yes, Allah may facilitate a lot of our affairs. But it does not mean that it will be like this forever. We ask Allah to give us understanding. In the second part of the khutbah, we will discuss the issue of anxiety and some of the natural spiritual remedies from the Quran and Sunnah. الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام الأتمان الأكملان على خير خلق الله أجمعين نبينا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد Brothers and sisters in faith Anxiety is the concept of someone who is often distressed about what could or might happen and those people often have the tendency to assume the worst. In any situation, they assume the worst. And if a person were to live like this, then that person would have a lot on his plate. And we don't know of any better solution than understanding the aqidah of the righteous predecessors properly. <clears throat> the actual solution is in that belief system that you hold in your heart. The more you know Allah Azza wa Jal, you know that He is just, you know that He is merciful, you know that He is all capable, He is all hearing, all seeing, all knowing, that He is the King, that He is the Sovereign, the more you will be able to live this life with a peace of mind. And you know that whatever Allah decreed will never ever miss you. What's been decreed for one of us is never to miss. 
It will happen. It will come to pass. Therefore, worrying about what could happen is absolutely useless. And it does not lead to anything constructive or positive. Rather, it leads to more stress until that person falls apart. We have a hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It's a beautiful hadith of Ibn Mas'ud. And that hadith is a lesson for the Ummah. And I hope and pray that I'm mistaken. But I would say perhaps 1% of the people in this masjid know it. I hope and pray that I'm wrong. But I would say and assume, based on my experience with my fellow Muslims, maybe 1% of the people here know it. Maybe zero. Or maybe some have heard it, but have not memorized it, and therefore they never implement it. Unless they're randomly reading a book of dua. In this hadith of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we learn that the Prophet said, in regards to the one who's suffering from stress and anxiety and depression to say, Allahumma inni abduka, ibn abdika, ibn amatika. Oh Allah, I am your slave, the son of your slave, the son of your maid servant. This is first acknowledgement that we are absolutely nothing. You're a slave? Your father is a slave and your mother is a slave. I'm a slave. My father is a slave. My mother is a slave to Allah. To Allah. And that is where dignity lies. That is where our honor is. In that slavery and servitude to Allah. Allahumma inni abduka. Allahumma inni abduka. Ibn abdika. Ibn amatika. Then the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam continued to teach us. To say, Maldin fiya dasiyati biyadik. My forelock is in your hand. Maldin fiya hukmuka. Your decree is forever established over me. Adlun fiya qadauka. Your affair, your decree is forever just as well. This is more of submission before Allah. As'aluka bi kulli ismin huwa lak. O oh Allah, I ask you by every name which belongs to you. Sammayta bihi nafsak. You called yourself by that name. Aw anzaltahu fi kitabika. Or you revealed it in your book. Aw allamtahu ahadan min khalqika. Or you taught it to any one of your creation. Aw istatharta bihi fi ilmi al-ghaybi indik. Or you kept it in the knowledge of the unseen with you. An taj'ala al-Qur'an rabi'a qalbi. That you make the Quran this, the, the life of my heart. Walura Sadri and the light of my chest. Huzni and the removal. The removal of my distress and the going away of my sorrow. The Prophet وسلم, said, No one makes this dua except that Allah will remove his anxiety and stress and replace it with joy. The question is, how many of us know that? We go searching on Google how to deal with anxiety and stress and what type of antidepressants to take. When we have this prophetic ruqya, from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And brothers, it's not merely reading it. Surely that is the opening, that is the beginning. It's about understanding it, internalizing it, digesting it, comprehending it, living by it, giving it to others, sharing it, reviving it when it's dead. It's all of those and more. We know that the Surah Al-Fatiha has a ruqya. We know that Al Mu'awidatan, Kul Audu Birabbi Falak, Al Kul Audu Birabbi Nas, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam used to often recite those suwar whenever he would be feeling ill, whatever type of illness. He would recite these suwar upon himself when he was ill. Aisha recited them and used his own hands to rub his body, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam.
We have many very basic, very straightforward surah from the Quran, ayat from the Quran, a hadith from the Prophet wasallam that deal with these issues. And no Muslim should feel that he is not in need of ruqya. This was the common practice of the Prophet wasallam When I say ruqya, people automatically start thinking of some sheikh somewhere whom they're gonna go and throw themselves before him and he's gonna do some amazing miraculous stuff and then the person is cured. This is not the case. Ruqya is an individual experience. People that have some severe cases, they have their own ways of dealing with it. And you can't just go to anybody who claims to be a Raqi. There are many crooks out there who will suck up your money and claim that they are curing you and they could be using magic making matters even worse. So you can't just submit to any fellow Muslim who claims to be on the right path. Sadly, we say this today because we have all types of people. But that should be the last thing you resort to. You should never seek a dua from anyone else. This is why the Prophet said about, about the 70,000 who will enter Jannah without any accountability is that they don't seek ruqya from others because ruqya is the type of dua and a believer doesn't tell people to make dua for him a believer makes dua for himself and for others don't you have a lord who hears you why does he have to say things on your behalf that is not from the way of the righteous predecessors to ask others to make dua for them wallahi it is allowed but it is not praiseworthy, it is not recommended. Make your own dua, make, do your own ruqya. There are books about this in English. Educate yourself, my brothers, about how to perform ruqya on oneself. Whenever we see that we're struggling in any one of these areas, physically, of course, first and foremost, and then spiritually, we should seek treatment. It is not okay to remain like this. You cannot keep this disease dormant because when it comes back out, it will bite your head off. Those are things you cannot sweep under the rug. Those are things that have to be resolved and cured. Immediate action is required. Similarly, if you're having signs of a stroke or a heart attack, you don't say, let me wait a couple of weeks, see how this plays out. You immediately go to the emergency because your life is on the line. And those spiritual diseases are more severe than a physical disease. And we have treasures of solutions within our deen. Allah Azza wa Jal did not reveal, did not send down an illness except that He sent down a cure. Alimahu man alimah wa jahilahu man jahila. Whosoever knows it knows it, whosoever does not know it does not know it. But the cure is there. I invite myself and you to familiarize yourself with the concept of seeking spiritual remedy through the Quran and the Sunnah. Because we are in times where envy is prevalent, jinn, uh, magic, evil eye, all of those, all of those. So many Muslims around us are struggling and dealing with these things in one way or another. And no one is exempt. So either you are curing an existing problem or you are preventing. You are in the stage of prevention. And prevention, as they say, is better than cure. Start doing something about it from now. It doesn't need that you go to university and study with five professors and spend 20,000 riyals to get a PhD in this. This is something you can do on your own every night by spending 10 minutes with a book. For a couple of weeks. Case closed. That's how simple it is. But we need to take the action. So in conclusion, the life to come is where there will be no pain. Only in Jannah. Allah promised there will be no pain. In this dunya, Allah promised us pain. He promised us. يا أيها الإنسان إنك كادح إلى ربك كدحا فملاقي 
O son of Adam, you will strive and struggle towards your Lord until you meet Him. Promise from Allah. وَلَنَبْلُوَنَّكُمْ Another ayah. And we shall inevitably test you. No doubt. It's a promise from Allah. But Allah tells us, مَنْ عَمِلَ صَالِحًا مِنْ ذَكَرٍ أَوْ أُنْثَى وَهُوَ مُؤْمِنٍ فَلَنُحْيَنَّهُ حَيَاةٌ طَيِّبًا Whosoever does righteous deeds, whether male or female, while they are believers, we will grant them a goodly life. How do you combine between the two? When those promises of Allah of calamities and, and difficulties come, because of that person's iman and righteous deeds, they will move on with their lives. It's almost like a Sudan. And those with iman and good deeds, have something to hold on to. So the storm will come and it will take away while it will take away and it will go and you're still there hanging on to the pole. And the one without Iman and good deeds, when the storm or the tornado or the tsunami comes, it will take them with everything else. Where would you like to stand? What would you like your position to be? Allah made that decision up to us in our hand, in our control. But we are weak, so we beg Allah for aid. We beg Allah for assistance. We realize the, rea the matters. We make an effort towards them. And Allah promised, Verily those who strive and struggle in our cause, we will definitely guide them to our path. And forever Allah is supporting the good doers. We ask Allah Azza wa Jal in His beautiful names and ultimate attributes to, among, to make us among the good doers. Allahumma ya muqallib al qulub thabbit qulubana ala deenik. Allahumma ya musarrif al qulub israf qulubana ala ta'atik. Rabbana la tuzir qulubana ba'd ad hadaytana wa hab lana min ladunka rahmatan innaka anta al wahab. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fi al akhirati hasana wa qina adab al nar. وصلي اللهم وسلم على النبي المختار